So far in this series, we've gone over quite a few concepts around Bash, but we're not done yet. In the previous video, we had a lot of fun. We wrote a universal update script, a script that we will be returning to later in the series. Because, well, you know what? There's always some refactoring that we can do in our scripts. But for now though, we're going to take a break from that script and take a look at for loops. And to understand exactly what for loops are and how they operate, the best way to actually show you is to, well, show you. So let's just dive right in. So what is a for loop? Essentially, a for loop allows you to perform a task repeatedly for every item in a set. Compared to an if statement, an if statement performs a task once if a certain set of conditions evaluates as true, whereas a while loop performs a task or set of tasks over and over again until a particular state is reached. A for loop is a concept of executing a command or set of commands against each item in a set. So let's take a look at a quick example and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. So as always, I'll go ahead and type it out and then I'll explain it. When it comes to a for loop, we set it up by giving it a list to iterate through. And when it iterates against the final element in the set, the loop is done and it exits. Here we write for followed by a variable. We can name this variable whatever we want to name it. In my case, I named it simply current number. And I didn't declare this anywhere else. As you can see, this is the entire script. So that variable didn't actually exist until we start using it in the for loop. We didn't need to declare it beforehand, but it's being declared as soon as the for loop starts running. Now, notice though that the variable name current number, that's actually a very long variable name. It's not really common to see a long variable name like that in a for loop. But the reason why I gave you guys a longer variable like you see here is because I really want to drive home the fact that you can call the variable whatever you want. If you were to look at for loop examples online, it's very common that you'll see just one character for the name of the variable here. And that might not make sense. Like, why would someone type that particular letter? We'll get to that. But what I want to show you first is that the variable name doesn't actually matter. Now for the set, I've typed out manually every item in the set, basically numbers one through 10 with a space in between each. Of course, that's not very efficient, but we'll clean it up shortly. So the first time it runs, current number will be set to one. When the for loop executes the first time, it's going to echo the variable that we created and what it currently equals, so at first it's simply one. Then it's going to sleep for about a second, which I've added for dramatic effect. And then when it reaches done, it's going to go back to the beginning of the for loop, but this time, current number will be pointing to the second item in the list, now number two. At that point, it's going to echo the variable contents again. This time it's two. And then the for loop will repeat over and over again for each item in the set until it reaches the end of the set. And then when it does, the loop is over. Now, admittedly, this example isn't very practical at all, but I will give you a more practical example you can actually use before I close out this particular lesson. Anyway, let's go ahead and continue on. What I'm going to do now is simplify the script a bit, and simplifying a script whenever it makes sense to do so is always a great idea. The fewer characters within a script, the easier the script is to maintain. So let's go ahead and clean this up a bit. And that's the only change that I'm going to make. This is way more efficient than the last example because I didn't manually type out every item in the list. What I have instead is a set of curly braces and inside that I have the number one, as you see here, two dots and then the number 10, one representing the lowest number, 10 representing the highest number. I can set that to 1000, 1 million, whatever I want to do. I'm not going to do that, but it's just referencing one to 10 at this time. Before we go any further, let's go ahead and run the script. So I'll save it and let's run it and see what happens. So as you can see, the script printed one through 10 and then the echo statement that was outside of the for loop 
where it printed, this is outside of the for loop that did print. We see that right here. So every line above that is part of the for loop. And then that echo statement was outside of the for loop and it was printed there at the end. So let's go ahead and bring up that script yet again. And another thing that I wanna do is actually rename this variable to n. So n for number, I guess. And we'll echo that. We'll change it here as well. That's another simplification that we can make. So for n in one to 10, n being a variable that just equals whatever the current item in the set is at the time it's running, it's going to echo what n currently equals or the current item in the set, sleep for one second, and then repeat over and over again until it reaches 10. And then once it reaches 10 in the set, it's going to break out of the for loop and then echo the statement that you see right here. Now, this version of the script was all well and good, but let's see an example that's actually somewhat useful. Now, this example right here has fewer lines, but you know what? This actually might be useful. Now, before you run this though, just be very careful what you run this script against. I don't think anything bad is going to happen, but if you are running on a production system, you probably should be running on a non-production system when you're learning, but what we're going to do is create some test files that we'll iterate through. But essentially what this is going to do, is going to look in the log files directory for any log file or any file that has a name that matches star.log, which is going to be anything that has a file name that ends in .log. So for every file in the log files directory that ends in .log, it's going to run the tar command and the options that it's going to run are czvf. It's going to create a zipped file. Verbose is what v stands for. We want to see what it's doing. And we're going to basically create a tarball or a compressed file for every file that's in the log files directory. And actually I have a little bit of a typo here. What we're going to do is type .tar.gz. We need to give the archived files a file name then we'll add the file variable again because we want to reference the file that we're actually going to archive. Let's save this particular file and minimize it. What we need to do right now is create that directory, otherwise this script will not work. And what I'm going to do is go into var log. I'm going to copy anything that ends in star.log and I'm going to copy those particular files into the log files directory. And it's okay that some of these log files I didn't have access to, that doesn't really matter. We just need some kind of content in the log files directory. So let's see what we have in there right now. So we have a number of files that end in .log. So the criteria for the for loop is actually met. We have a log files directory, and inside there, we have a bunch of files that end in .log. What I'm also going to do I'll create another one called logfile.txt. Just so that way I have something that won't match the criteria. These are the files that I currently have in that directory. So let's go ahead and run our script. Moment of truth. So here we see a line of output for every file that our script actually processed. And if I list the contents of our log files directory, we can see that we have tar.gz files right there. So it actually did tar up those particular files. So we have compressed versions of each of those. So basically the script worked. We can now use this script if we want to compress a large amount of files. It's a simple example and you can certainly extend it to make it more efficient. But as you can see, it definitely works. Now what we could do is remove the uncompressed files to get them off our system. It's very common if we have a Linux server that is nearing full capacity of the storage. So what we could do is start tarring up some files and then remove the original files to reclaim some space. Now obviously you'd probably want to use something like log rotate. That would be a much better way to do this, but that's outside of the scope of this series. But either way, we have an example of a for loop that actually gives us value. So back in our script, I'll go over it one more time just to refresh everything. So for file, in this case file is a variable, we're creating a variable. 
This is a variable that the for loop will use to iterate over the contents of the log files directory, where it's looking for any file that ends in .log inside that directory, and then for every file that it finds, what it's going to do is it's going to run the tar command against that file. It's going to create a tarball or a compressed file that is called file.tar.gz, but file in this case is part of that file name is actually the name of a file that we want to compress. So when bash runs this, it's going to replace dollar sign file in that command with the actual file name dot log that is currently iterating over within the log files directory. And the file that it's going to compress is that file called file. And then the for loop exits like you see right here. So that's a very simple example, but it might even add value. That's really cool. And while you may or may not have a use case for a simple script like this one, imagine all the things that you can apply this type of logic to, and even how you could extend this script to make it even more useful. For example, if you have a mail utility installed on the server, you could have the script email each of the compressed log files to someone. And considering how a lot of companies out there have deliverables that they have to get sent out, this logic could actually automate an entire delivery system. Now, you might not use for loops quite as often as other features within Bash, but it's yet another component of Bash that you can either use or at least add to your toolbox in case a use case comes up for it later. On your end, are you able to find other use cases for a for loop? Go ahead and practice, have some fun, and learn. And once you get some extra practice in, we can go ahead and move on to the next lesson. So there you go. I hope you guys are enjoying this series so far. I've had a lot of fun recording this series for you guys. And the next episode is already there waiting for you. So whenever you're ready to learn the next concept around Bash, well, I'll meet you over in that video and we'll do just that. In the meantime, though, thank you so much for checking out this video and I'll see you in the next episode.